So behind me is a B-17G known as Sentimental Journey. And tomorrow, I get to go for a ride on it. So follow along as I do a ground tour and a ride on this magnificent machine. In the summer of 2023, the Sentimental Journey came to Medicine Hat, Alberta. I bought a ticket for a ride in the Navigator and Bombardier seats and wasn't sure what to expect. This video is dedicated to all those airmen who fought, with many of them making the ultimate sacrifice so that we can enjoy many of the freedoms we live with today. We must never forget their sacrifices. This B-17G was built by Douglas Aircraft in late 1944 and was accepted by the U.S. Army Air Forces on 13th of March 1945 where it was assigned to the Pacific Theater for the duration of World War II. After World War II, this B-17 was converted for photo mapping missions and was later converted for use in at-sea rescue missions. In 1951, it was converted for use as a mothership to control unmanned radio controlled B-17s for upper air analysis of radioactive cloud samples and to study blast and thermal effects during Operation Greenhouse, which was an atmospheric nuclear test series conducted by the United States. Its military use ended in 1959, where it was converted to civilian registration and used as a water bomber for 18 years. In 1978, the Arizona Commemorative Air Force acquired it, where it was named the Sentimental Journey after a Doris Day song that was popular in the 1940s, and it received the nose art of Betty Grable. The Commemorative Air Force restored the aircraft into what you see today, with the authentic turrets, bomb sites, and other equipment. It is often regarded as one of the most authentically restored remaining examples of a wartime B-17. The Sentimental Journey is powered by four Wright Cyclone nine-cylinder radial engines of the 1820 series. These engines were commonly referred to as being turbo-supercharged in their era, which resulted in a power output of 1,200 horsepower each and the forced induction allowed for high-altitude operations. You'll see what a combined 4,800 horsepower sounds like later in this video. The B-17 has a conventional landing gear configuration which made the aircraft well equipped for grass and dirt runways. The B-17 was well fortified with guns for daytime bombing missions which earned the B-17 the nickname of being called the Flying Fortress. In the nose of the B-17G variant was a chin turret controlled by the bombardier and two cheek guns controlled by the navigator. The tail gunner operated two 50 caliber guns and sat on his knees for hours at a time with a small seat taking some of his weight. The tail gunner had one of the most important roles as enemy fighters often approach from the rear because of the slower closure rate. A shot down B-17 in a dive often put forces on the tail gunner that would trap him in this position and prevent his escape. Arguably one of the worst gunner positions on a B-17 the ball turret gunner would have to climb through a hatch from the fuselage into the turret while in flight, often leaving behind his parachute as it couldn't fit in the turret with most gunners. The ball turret gunner sat in the turret while in a fetal position with his knees up to his ears, often for periods of up to 10 hours or more while being exposed to freezing temperatures. The gunner's hands and feet operated the turret and gun sight movement and operated the firing mechanism and intercom. The waist gunner positions were manned by two gunners, each operating a 50 caliber gun. These waist gunners had no seats and would sit on the floor of the aircraft until enemies were spotted, where they would then be standing and pivoting around their positions for several hours. On this aircraft, you can see a plexiglass window, but during the war, these were unprotected openings with no plexiglass, which exposed the gunners to extreme below freezing temperatures for several hours at a time. Climbing up the stairs and into the sentimental journey leads you to the nose where the navigator and bombardier positions are. This is where the two would work together for flight planning and setting up for the bombing runs. And this is where I'll be sitting when I get to go for a flight on this aircraft. Climbing above the navigator and bombardier positions leads you to the cockpit which is manned by a pilot and co-pilot. From this position you have a clear view of the top side of each wing and each engine. The control surfaces of the B-17 are all cable operated and the aircraft was very technologically advanced for its time. It was equipped with an autopilot system that allowed the pilot to turn over lateral control to the bombardier and the Norden bomb site. 
Walking towards the rear of the aircraft from the cockpit sends you to a small catwalk that runs through the bomb bay of the aircraft towards the waste gunner and radio operator positions. On either side of the catwalk are the bomb racks. Bomb sizes and types were chosen depending on their intended target and the loadout was also dependent on the amount of fuel on board and distance to be flown, but common loads were 4,000 to 6,000 pounds. Walking along the catwalk takes you to the waste gunner and radio operator positions. On the sentimental journey, seats were added and a person can buy a ticket to go for an aerial tour in these seats. The radio operator had a view of the top side of the wing and sat at a small desk to operate the radios. The radio operator also had access to an auxiliary gun position at the top of the fuselage. The aircraft was equipped with radios for short and long-range communication that provided two-way communication amongst crew members, communication with other aircraft and ground stations, and detection of marker beacons for navigation. The old photographs laid amongst the various positions of the sentimental journey helps to draw tour goers into the wartime era and gets you thinking about the brave airmen. What left me speechless was the bomb bay of the sentimental journey. There are signatures of airmen and memorial notes of airmen who have since passed written within the walls of the bomb bay area. Here is just a brief glimpse into a handful of those signatures. Second Lieutenant Stephen Polovchak was a co-pilot of a B-17G named El Lobo II from the 748th Squadron of the 457th Bombardment Group. On March 19, 1945, the El Lobo II was involved in a bombing run of a German railway station. On its return flight, the aircraft was damaged by flak. Despite a failed engine and fuel tanks full of holes, the aircraft was able to land on its belly in northern France. The entire flight crew were eventually met by American troops on the ground, who successfully brought the flight crew back to England. Tech Sergeant Ted Meachie joined the Army Air Forces in 1942, where he started work as a mechanic and later became a radio operator on board the B-17G known as Thundermug, with the 364th Squadron of the 305th Bombardment Group. Tech Sergeant Michi flew his 25th and last mission on March 22, 1944, and was later discharged from the Air Force in 1945. Tech Sergeant Michi was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross and an Air Medal with three oak leaf clusters. Captain Dick Nelms flew 35 missions in a B-17G known as Pandora's Box with the 710th Squadron of the 447th Bombardment Group. During one of his missions, Pandora's box returned with over 300 holes and was so badly damaged that the aircraft never saw combat again. Captain Nelms was awarded a Distinguished Flying Cross, five air medals, and a Presidential Unit Citation. Second Lieutenant Roland Martin joined the 525th Squadron of the 379th Bombardment Group where he flew the B-17F known as the Iron Maiden. On October 14, 1943, the Iron Maiden was tasked with a bombing run of a ball bearing plant in Schweinfurt, Germany. It was to be 2nd Lieutenant Martin's 10th mission. The Iron Maiden was damaged by flak and made a forced landing in a field in Germany. 2nd Lieutenant Martin and the rest of the flight crew were captured as POWs. 2nd Lieutenant Martin spent his time in Stalag Luft No. 1 until April 1945 when the camp was liberated and he returned to the United States. Colonel Jesse Jacobs flew 28 missions over Germany in a B-17 with the 861st and 862nd squadrons of the 493rd Bombardment Group, and later flew 121 missions flying F-80s in Korea. Colonel Jacobs then spent 19 years as a test pilot in various Air Force test programs. Colonel Jacobs' awards include the Legion of Merit, Distinguished Flying Cross, Air Medal with 11 Oak Leaf Clusters, and an Air Force Commendation Medal with Oak Leaf Cluster. The signatures in the Bombay area are an absolutely incredible testament to the bravery and sacrifice of the airmen who served. If you can find your way to visit this aircraft, you will be left speechless after reading through all the signatures, and you'll likely spend more time in the Bombay area than any other part of the aircraft. Now with a short pre-flight briefing and donning flight suits, we were ready to go for a flight on Sentimental Journey. 
The following segment will not have any speech or music. I want you to enjoy the full experience of the sights and sounds of being on this B-17.
After we landed and I was walking back to my family, my wife asked me, how was it? I could not come up with an answer that fully described what I had experienced. It took me days to gather my thoughts. The best I can describe is that the experience took me on a fire-breathing trip through time. I will never forget the feel in my chest of what 4,800 horsepower feels like. I will never forget reading through the signatures in the Bombay, and will never forget those airmen and their astonishing level of bravery. When you go through the ground tour and a flight on this aircraft, you are left with an experience that lives up to the aircraft's name. It truly is a sentimental journey.